What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode is Russell Napier. Russell is one of those people who you can't really define with simple labels like investor or professor. He's both of those things. But he's also an absolutely brilliant storyteller who has produced some of the best work in financial history that I've ever read. So when I saw that he was out with a new book, I knew first I had to read it, and second, that I had to talk to him about it, because it covers a period of time that I think many investors are either not familiar with or haven't studied anywhere near as closely as they should, given its relevance to the age in which we are living today, an age characterized by excessive debt levels, financial repression, market concentration, and all of the unintended consequences that arise from the perverse incentives that these dynamics create. We spend the first hour of our conversation discussing the crisis itself, its drivers, as well as the practices and policies that made it possible. The second hour is spent on the resolution of the crisis and applying the lessons learned from that period to today, with implications for the future path of interest rates, inflation, growth, political stability, and most practically, opportunities for investing in the new market regime that we are moving into. Since this episode deals with markets and investing, I want to make absolutely clear that nothing we say on this podcast can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guest are solely our own opinions and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, I hope you all enjoy what is a truly exceptional conversation with my guest, investor, historian, and author, Russell Napier. Russell Napier, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you. It's great having you on. So, Russell, for those who aren't familiar with you, give me a brief summary of who you are and the breadth of your financial career, because you're you're not easy to categorize. You're a professor, you're a financial historian, you're an investor. So how would you describe yourself? I uh, Well, let's give you the uh, summary of the career and then try and sum that up. So I trained as a lawyer, so I have no formal qualification at all in anything to do with economics or finance. Uh, became a fund manager for a few years. And then in 1995, went to Asia to work in the stockbroking business, writing analysis, basically global macro analysis or Asian macro analysis, and stumbled into the middle of what became the Asian financial crisis. But I continued writing that research for the company I was with then called CLSA all the way till 2014, which stage I became independent and uh, then began to write on my own accord. That's one strain of what I've been doing. I've written the previous book called Anatomy of the Bear, which looked at the history of the four great bear market bottoms in the US. Uh, I also set up a course in finance in 2004 called A Practical History of Financial Markets. And most of our students for that are professional investors. I'm also on the board of a listed company here. We have closed end funds are quite a big business over here. And uh, I'm on the board of one of those funds. But the trend going through all of that would be, I would say, financial history, money, and credit. So it's not just financial history, it's a focus on money and credit. And if I look at the certainly the disasters I've stumbled into over the years, they've usually have been associated with, with credit in particular. And therefore, I focus on that and understanding it as being part of this. So I describe myself as a financial historian, though I'm a very much a self-taught financial historian, and providing financial advice to investors based upon money, credit, and financial history. There's no simple title for that, but I do have a very nice title because I have self-styled myself the keeper of the library of mistakes, and you're not going to get much better than that. That's pretty good. So what led you to write this book? The book is about, it's about the Asian financial crisis. It's really about the, the better part of the 1990s, and the forces that were unleashed upon the world with how that crisis was dealt with. So what led you to write this book and why did you focus on that period? The re- obvious reason is I was there. I was there and I was in situ for I had a front row seat. Uh, if you're a broker, you have a front row seat in any financial crisis. And I thought I had something to add by going back to look at it. I thought it was important and we maybe will come back to why I thought it was important. but. I read a lot of financial history. And it's obvious when you read it that it's the bane of the historian is to look back with the benefit of hindsight. 
At what age did you begin to express an interest in financial history? And why did you find it so interesting? So I arrived in this business as a lawyer, not knowing anything about it. So I had to learn very quickly. And one of the things that interested me was not the theoretical textbooks of how it should work, but some examples of how it did work. So often I would go to my colleagues who were you know, many, many more years experienced than me and start asking them about, okay, you saw inflation rise and what did you do? And often they didn't fully understand it or they couldn't remember it or they hadn't made notes. So I would start reading financial history to educate myself as a quicker way of doing it than reading financial theory. I thought financial history was a quicker route to it. So that's where you start when you are 22 or 23 or whatever. And then you keep going. But it seemed to me, uh, I mean, I, I liken it to biology. If I, Biology is a study of the internal organisms, but it's not a study of the behavior. Financial theory to me is a study of biology, but it's not a study of behavior. So I was much more interested in the behavior and I couldn't find that in the financial textbooks. I could find out how people were supposed to behave, but it didn't seem to correlate with the way they had behaved. So I find more value in that and kept reading it. Do you think that mainstream economists, analysts, et cetera, have evolved their views on how the economy works in the intervening years since the crisis, that a lot of what you were sort of attuned to at the time has seeped out into the broader conversation? It has somewhat improved. I mean, basically, the problem was, we go back to the last big crisis, is we didn't pay any attention to the credit system. We thought it was not important. It was just not a key issue. So that was a lesson mm -hmm. learned the hard way. And therefore, we're paying more attention to it. That is not the same thing as saying we're paying enough attention to it. So I, although we may have progress, I don't think we've progressed very far. But more mm -hmm. attention to this stuff is really important. Our central bankers don't seem to pay any attention to it whatsoever. And, uh, you know, they get a lot of blame for that. But, you know, we've given them an inflation target, full stop. Maybe we should have been mm -hmm. giving them much bigger financial stability targets and maybe a financial stability target it conflicts with the inflation target. So central bankers in particular, I, don't, I think, still do not pay enough attention to credit, credit markets, growth of credit. But mm -hmm. uh, as Charlie Munger always says, show me incentives and I'll show you outcomes. Mm -hmm. We've told them to go for inflation. They go for inflation. Everything else has to adjust to that. We've, you know, we give them the wrong targets. We can't really blame them for playing, the, playing to the target. Mm. You know, there's also something that flashed into my head as we're talking, this happens sometimes, is an interview that I did with Tim Grover, who was Michael Jordan's conditioning strength personal trainer for the entire period in which he was a champion. He also trained Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, and other just elite world uh, competitors. And he talked about how when he would throw them chess passes in practice, that he would throw them all over the place. And the reason he did that was because he didn't want them to be comfortable and you see this everywhere else too. It, I'm thinking about it in sports and weightlifting where people like to do things that they're good at because they're good at it and they make sense to them, they understand it. But successful investing requires operating in an environment of uncertainty. And as you said in the book, forecasting is the process of trying to find out what you don't know by what you do. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is a problem in modern economics that we are paying people to be precise and you can't be precise. So they will play to what you incentivize them on. And they will use that decimal point in particular to show how precise they are. Certainty sells. That's the bottom line. If I say in front of you and say something certain, people will pay more attention to it than if I say to you something uncertain. So when you professionalize economics, people are tempted to come in to show just how, how good they are by coming up with this very precise forecast with a decimal point. That is dangerous when you're a forecaster. I think it's particularly dangerous when you're a policymaker. I mean, what policymakers should be focusing on is the possible range of outcomes and how to react to them. That is getting better than it was in the past, but we're still back to this situation where everybody's trying to make that forecast to a decimal point. And once you've done that, you tend to play to it. That's what you tend mm -hmm. to play to. And it may leave you unequipped for the broader range of outcomes that, that come along. We've just lost Donald Rumsfeld, of course, and Donald Rumsfeld probably put it better than anybody. And what I would say is professional economists, you know, they kind of stick to the known knowns because that's what they feel they can forecast. Yeah. But it's pretty dangerous to ignore the known unknowns. Of course, the unknown unknowns we'll never know, but the known unknowns, we need to find a better way of encompassing those in policy. Well, you have a, a beautiful part in the book where you talk about how as we moved into this next phase, and we'll get to this towards the end, probably in the overtime, which is that investors will look for new certainties. And I think there is that tendency. We all want to find things that we can hold on to because ultimately we have to use frameworks in order to navigate the world. 
regardless of how imperfect they are. But so this brings us to where I wanted to go next, which is that the book is full of contemporaneous writings, your writings from the period in question, roughly 1995 to 1998. Why did you choose to write the book in this way, to include what you were thinking 20, 25 years ago. So this is following up on my first book as well, where I went back to 1921. People will be relieved to know that I wasn't around in 1921. <laughs> but the contemporaneous writings I chose then were the Wall Street Journal. So I've done this before, and here's why I've done it. It is obvious to any historian when you look back that you're looking back with the benefit of hindsight. And you can see patterns that people at the time did not see. And because you see those patterns, you attribute the behavior of those people to maybe stupidity. Basically, that's it. You think, oh, these guys, they were so stupid, they didn't see that coming. You almost assume that they would have understood things yeah. that you now understand. Correct. And it's far too easy to go back and look at our ancestors and say, you know, they were so stupid and we are so bright. No, we are just as stupid as they were. So I want to go back and find out why stupid, smart people did stupid things. So I'm looking at my own writings for that, because obviously I've done some stupid things in the past as well. That's the real value in contemporaneous writing. We, It's the fog of war. This is someone looking into the fog of war. We all know what was, what was through that fog. That person, whether it's me or a journalist for the Wall Street Journal, didn't know. And maybe the real value to work out the future is to look at constant forecastable mistakes, mass mistakes, mm. mass error and say, when you see this sort of error going on, that's the time when you want to buy, if you're an investor, buy shares or sell shares. Mm -hmm. So I think there's huge value in contemporaneous opinion. And I think it would be wonderful if people were doing more of this because it's so much easier to do than it used to be. It used to be you'd have to go to a dusty old museum, down to the basement, find the microfiche machine, mm. scroll through the microfiche, no search function. <laughs> and now one can sit in the comfort of one's own home if you pay the subscription to the right service and really do a lot of work on contemporaneous mm. opinion to find out uh, where it was wrong. And I think there's, particularly for mm. financial markets, when so much of it is forward looking anyway, I think there's real value in this. Uh, I'm plowing a lonely field, I feel at the moment, but the time will come when other people see the value in contemporaneous opinion. Most of it gets thrown away. I mean, here in this country, we used to call newspapers, in the good old days when we had actual paper, tomorrow's fish and chip paper. That's how much we valued it. It was kind of thrown away. Uh, Stockbrokers research, for instance, is uh, deeply, deeply uh, despised by most people who, who read it. But it's a pretty good reflection of the consensus opinion. And, and when you're looking back as a historian, I think there's real value in that. Well, there was another great line in the book where you said that there was a lot of wishful thinking going on during the crisis. And that a big part of the reason for that was because people didn't want to do the work or they knew that it would take a lot of work to try and figure out what was really going on. And that reminds me of something else I wanted to ask you. And again, we'll, we'll probably get into this later. And that has to do with how the investment profession has changed for people like you, who now have access to data that you couldn't have had access to 20 or 25 years ago when trying to understand capital flows, the macro environment, et cetera. But you know, in the interest of not losing the plot here, I want to bring it back to the book. So the central preoccupation in the book with your writing during this period was with guessing what was on the other side of the hill, to quote Arthur Wellesley, and specifically with trying to assess when this unsustainable credit cycle that you were witnessing in real time was going to end. Do you agree with that depiction? I mean, was that the state of your mind during the time of these writings? That's absolutely right. And that is the problem for everybody in finance. Most people can see things that are unsustainable. The problem is they don't know when they become unsustainable. And you can lose your career in waiting for that to happen. And many people have seen their careers end as they've waited for the unsustainable to be proved unsustainable. It's easier to find that than you think it is. And most people see it. The question is, mm. how do you stay until one minute to midnight? Should you stay until one minute to midnight? And it's, it's unfortunate that professional investors are kind of paid for that. And maybe they shouldn't be paid for that, but they aren't paid for that. So what I have in this book are lots of things that will help you stay. I don't know if it's going to help you stay to one minute to midnight, but you know it's going to help you stay towards the end a bit longer than maybe you would have said. But fundamentally, I think if you're if you're a personal investor, you've got to wonder whether you want to do it at all. But if you want to get into that business, uh, then I hope this book has lots of indicators as to when the un an unsustainable credit boom becomes actually unsustainable. I run a course in finance, as I mentioned, the practical history of financial markets. One of our teachers, Gordon Pepper, who was uh, basically doing the same job as I do, but actually ended up advising Margaret Thatcher on monetary affairs. 
Uh, mm. he, has, he has a great rule. He says, when you think you see something that is unsustainable, rationally work out the maximum period you think it can be sustained, then double it and take off a month. Well, look, this is one of the things I found most valuable about reading the book, which is that you know we're all grappling with this as investors all the time. So many people have been saying that these valuations and that this credit cycle that we're living through is unsustainable. That's one of the most obvious things that you can say. But figuring out when the party ends, thinking through scenarios of how it might end, and being able to pick up on those signals well in advance of its conclusion can make all the difference between success and failure for investors, particularly during a time where the macro dynamics are more determinant of individual outcomes. And that's where you were in 1995. You were trying to work out this credit cycle. What were the major outstanding questions that you were asking yourself, that you were grappling with at the time in order to answer the bigger question of when the party was going to end? Well, investors had a great advantage in that period, and that is that these countries ran managed exchange rates. They weren't flexible exchange rates, they were managed. Now, anybody who's ever tried to solve an equation will know if you've got one fixed variable, it gives you some prospect of solving everything else or massively increases mm -hmm. your prospects. So we had that. So the question we had to ask really every day was simple. These countries, certainly Southeast Asia, they're all running large current account deficits. So to be optimistic on that country, you really had to work out where the capital was coming to fund those deficits because you wanted enough capital to come to keep the currency steady but also to allow the, the country to run re relatively easy monetary policy, expansionary monetary policy. So every day you had to work out, where's the capital coming to fund the deficit? And all I was doing through that early stage of that period was saying, you know what, two or three years ago, most of this capital was coming in the form of foreign direct investment. And that is sticky money. It literally digs a hole in the ground and pours in concrete and it doesn't disappear. <laughs> Define for our listeners what FDI is and how it differs from hot money flows that became characteristic of, of the pre-crisis period. Well, foreign direct investment, I guess you can put it in two categories. And one is where you, you really do dig a hole in the ground and you build a factory. But you need to you, know, you need to sell dollars, you need to buy Thai baht, you get the Thai baht, you buy the land with Thai baht, you buy the cement with Thai baht, you hire the employees with Thai baht, and it's just that factory sits there. Uh, if we ever wanted to get our money out, we'd have to go and sort of negotiate a buyer for that. He'd have to give it, and, and it's a slow, laborious process. And the other thing is you could just buy out right a Thai company. I, I come in, I see this great Thai retail company and I buy it, but it's the same thing. It's quite tricky to get the money back out then. It's a very illiquid asset. That's what was funding the initial stages of the, the Asian economic miracle. By the time I arrived, the mix had changed entirely. A lot of it was portfolio investment. So that would be the great fund management companies of the world buying listed equities. And of course, you can reverse that in an afternoon. That's very, very liquid. Mm -hmm. But the second one underlying that was bankers. The Asians, remember these Asian currencies were linked to the dollar. So if you were a banker, you said, well, there's no currency risk here. If I lend to these ties, they're okay. They, they have a, the business they're investing these dollars in then generates Thai baht, but the Thai baht's linked to the United States dollar. So it's basically the same thing and there's no risk. So you then had this debt and a lot of that was very short term in nature. A lot of it is tenors of three to six months. So mm -hmm. we were shifting. So to me, the, the alarm bell that was ringing was the deterioration in the quality of the capital inflow that was funding these mm -hmm. deficits. This is not an issue in a flexible exchange rate regime. But when you've got a managed exchange rate regime, the composition of the capital account, uh, I think is very, is, uh, is very important. It turned out to be very important because the unthinkable happened. I mean, the unthinkable was so predictable. It was that one day it wouldn't come, but nobody thought that would happen. You know, this is the Asian mm. economic miracle. We're going to fund this forever. The, con the, the, the whole concept that one day we wouldn't fund it, that the money wouldn't come in, just seemed impossible because everybody knew this was where the growth was. One, one little story that's in the book, British pension funds had more money in Asian equities than they had in American equities. Now, that, that's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. And of course, it was completely wrong. Some of these Asian markets, by the way, in terms of the capital indices measured in dollar terms, are still below where they were in 1994. Well, we all know where the American stock market is. 1994, by the way, is when Jeff Bezos set up Amazon. So it turned out that where you really wanted to be investing was America, but they had so yeah. much money in Asia. And the point is people thought it would go on forever because it was so clear this is where the growth was. And that's one of the great lessons of financial history is that economic growth is not necessarily related to returns from equities anyway. I mean, America's economic growth over the past 30 years has, has been you know, not bad, but not good. But look at the stock market. Mm-hmm. 
Well, that brings us to the point about capital flows. And 1994, by the way, was the year that Netscape launched its browser. So absolutely true. A couple of points to clarify for listeners. When you talk about the quality of capital, we're really talking about how committed that capital is. And when we're talking about what makes FDI so different is that it is illiquid. It's not something that people can easily sell. And so I guess I, I wonder, maybe just to drill a little deeper on this, how has the liquefaction of finance, of, of assets, of the world, and the increasing rate of turnover of financial assets, how has that restructured the financial system and changed the spectrum and distribution of financial returns in a way that has been destabilizing? And where would you put securitization in all of that? That is a fantastic question. It is so key, so important, and so few people focus on it. But the the liquefaction of assets has changed the planet, and it's unsustainable because it creates, Soros recalls it, the wrecking ball of global capitalism. Now, he's, he's not exactly a man who criticizes capitalism, but this particular element of it, the ability to move capital that quickly, can be a wrecking ball. And it isn't necessary to have a system that's that liquid, to have a system that allocates capital well, because we've never had a system that's this liquid in terms of capital moving around. And I don't mean just internally, sort of switching from US equities to US bonds to US mortgage-backed securities. I mean cross-border as well. It has been very difficult ever for us to establish a cross-border regime that could ever deal with capital flowing at this pace. We had open capital accounts before World War I. Capital did flow across borders, but it wasn't really flowing to securities. It did flow to securities, but not in the way it does today. It was more going to foreign direct investment. So it's highly destabilizing the ability to move this money around. It's one of the reasons why the Asian crisis was so big as it could happen so quickly. If that money couldn't move quickly, the local economies would have had time to adjust. Bankers would have had time to adjust. But the adjustment was forced on them so rapidly on both sides of this when the money was coming in and when the money was going out mm. that as a policymaker, it has made it almost impossible to mm. manage this. And for small economies in particular, where this capital can arrive very quickly. So the conclusion to me from all of that is we'll have to get away from that. And there will be going forward in the new world, more attempts to slow down the pace at which capital moves because financial structures can't cope, but ultimately societies can't cope with the pace of it. And most people will say that's a really bad thing. It's you know it's maybe a bad thing, but it's not a terribly bad thing as long as long-term capital continues to get to where it needs to get. This need to have excessive liquidity on the way is not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. Again, this reminds me of one of the very first episodes I ever did with Mark C. Taylor. He's a philosopher and theologian out of Columbia University. And he wrote a book called Speed Limits. And he dealt with this issue, not just in finance, but in other areas of the economy with technology. Things are constantly speeding up. And that is changing our world in ways that I just don't think most people can appreciate. And in this case, it directly impacts the allocation of capital, where and how we invest. And, and like you say, it creates crises where otherwise they wouldn't exist. And it alters incentives. Something else I want to talk about, you, you touched on it earlier and you made me think of it, which is that one of the things I, I noticed in the book when you talked about how investors saw Asia, it felt to me like what you were saying was that when Westerners looked at Asia, they saw something very different than what Asians saw in their own countries. And it seemed, now this is something, again, I'm reminded of the work of Edward Said and Orientalism, which is that Americans have always had, Americans, uh, Westerners, have always had a particular fascination with Orientalist cultures, with Eastern cultures, and they've ascribed to them values, ideas that aren't necessarily theirs, but are those of the other, maybe things that they themselves aspire to or keep hidden. How important were Western perceptions of Asia, what the Asian market was, what it meant to invest in Asia for the decisions that fund managers made in allocating in that part of the world? But they, they were absolutely crucial. That misconception was at the heart of what was going on here because it was not just that these economies were growing rapidly. They were supposed to have something called Asian values. And if you asked a Westerner what those Asian values were, they would basically give you the same values that Adam Smith would have had in the Wealth of Nations, you know, thrift, saving, investment. Mm. Well, that's what we heard about the thrifty, saving Asians 
the savings glut was described in very Protestant terms, ironically. You know, it was straight out of Max Weber, uh, Protestantism and the capitalist work ethic. And that's what they saw when they looked there. And to some extent, in certain parts of it, particularly in some expatriate Chinese communities, that was true. But it was to ignore something else. Now, the best person to sum up the philosophy of Asia, I think, is Lee Kuan Yew. And if you look at how Lee Kuan Yew constructed Singapore, he also constructed Singapore that it would play down the rights of the individual and play up the rights of the communal. So Singaporeans accept certain restrictions on the rights of the individual to the benefit of the communal. And that wasn't Lee Kuan Yew imposed it. He derived it from the local culture. Now, that local culture is different all over Asia, and it was even more stronger in Northern Asia, the communalism, if you like. I mean, America is a nation of individuals because in terms of who lives there at the minute, they, they came from somewhere else and they came as individuals. And that's the bit of the culture that they didn't get. So yes, there were thrifty people there who you might have said who leapt off the pages of, of Weber's Protestantism and <laughs> the spirit of capitalism. But Japan is a very communal country. And the idea that, let's say, a hedge fund manager would dictate Japanese interest rates to the people and the people would accept it or the politicians would accept it simply wasn't going to happen. Now, underneath all of this as well, there were layers of corruption. I'm not saying the developed world is absent corruption, but the foreign investors who'd all been to business school came in and didn't even see the corruption because they didn't know where to look because they hadn't been trained to look for the corruption. So there were layer after layer after layer. That's any society has these layers. Asia has these layers. Each country has different layers. Mm. What Westerners saw when they came in is what they were trained to see by reading finance textbooks. And it was at best half the picture and probably less than half the picture. And the, here's the problem. That didn't really matter until things started going wrong. <laughs> it's only mm -hmm. when things started to go wrong that they began to realize the consequences of these other things that they simply hadn't bothered to really think about properly. Yeah. I mean, in the book, you talked about that in multiple places, but one that sticks out was with respect to Thailand and the red flags you began to see there about anticipating that the rules were going to change. And that's something that I think is very relevant to today. What I, I mean, reading your book, I thought, wow, this was my experience with the 2008 financial crisis. You know, I understood more or less the underlying dynamics of the economy, but I simply took it as a given that the rules would stay the same. I didn't understand that the rules were also a variable. They were also constructed and they could change. And I think that's also expresses the danger similarly with currency pegs of ascribing too much certainty to different things, things that have been there for a while. And just because they've been there, you assume they'll always be there, but they're not a feature of the landscape. They are man-made, they're constructed. I want to bring it back to the crisis because I want also, not, you know, the truth is that most people aren't really going to know much about the Asian financial crisis. Even people that lived through the period, they're not going to know much about it. So I would love to one, I, I, I'm curious to know what you think about where it ranks as someone who studied financial crises, where the Asian financial crisis ranks in the history of manias and crashes. And when, in your estimation, did the crisis really begin? Because most people associated with Thailand in 1997, but when would you say the crisis began? When did you begin to see the crisis when you were in Hong Kong? So I forecast the crisis, but the evidence that I was right didn't begin to appear until I would say the summer of 1996. And I've been forecasting it since May 1995. And that may not sound like a long period, but believe me, when you're in the front line, that's a long time not to have evidence to support your thesis. So what was the evidence that this was beginning to go the wrong way? It was really capital flows and foreign exchange reserves. So in a period where you are managing your exchange rate and money is pouring in, your foreign exchange reserves go up. You intervene in the stock market. You, you take the foreign currency from people and you create local currency and that data is out every month and we watch it. And then suddenly in 1996, Thailand began to go the other way. And that was the first indication. That did not tell you that we were definitely going to a crisis. But suddenly you thought, this doesn't just go in one direction. How are you getting that data? Well, that data is just standard global macro data. It comes out every month and it's available everywhere. Yeah. So you saw the, the shift in the capital flows in Thailand. That's where you be, that's, That was the first signal for you. Yeah. So if that were to continue, then the argument was, you know, and this was an analysis going back to David Hume in the 18th century, that interest rates would go up and that the central bank wouldn't have no control over that. That was just a natural mechanism through which interest rates would go up. According to Hume's analysis, that would slow the economy. Prices would maybe fall. Thailand would become more competitive. 
and the cycle would begin all over again. But the problem was that anybody could see that the financial system of Thailand and the property market were incredibly weak. And if Thailand was to have higher interest rates forced upon it, that it could crumble. And I think quite quickly from the summer of 96, people said, well, you know, it's quite normal for countries to live with rising interest rates, but the structure of this financial system in Thailand is so weak that it actually can't. So it was relatively quick through the course of that year. You'd already lost a lot of your money in Thai equities long before they devalued, because we saw that even marginally higher interest rates would crush a very fragile system. Did people not appreciate how dependent the... Thai economy and also just generally the, the Asian economies were to capital inflows, that they thought that the boom was primarily driven by fundamentals, but in fact, it was actually being driven by foreign capital? Yeah, that's exactly right. And there was one form of foreign capital which they really ignored until it was far too late, and that was bankers. Now, I realize that people listening to this who are not in finance think that financiers sit down in a room every day and talk to each other. It's not true. Bankers people who make loans don't necessarily talk to people who buy equities, who don't necessarily talk to people who buy bonds. And everybody who was buying the equities really came very late to understand that the bankers had lent a huge amount of dollars to these countries. So what the borrower did is he sold the dollars and he bought Thai baht or he bought Indonesian rupiah and invested in local instruments. And we didn't get that. We didn't understand that. And when the data came out, and I, I think I only began to show that data in early 1997, so this was before the devaluation of the bat. Most people I showed the data to didn't believe me. They said this data is wrong. Now, the reason that's really embarrassing is that those people worked for the same organizations that were making the loans. They worked in the portfolio management bit and the bankers were in the bank lending bit, but the two guys never spoke to each other. Mm. So one of the things you've really got to be careful about, particularly these managed exchange rate regimes, is their ability to borrow foreign currency. And we missed that until it was way, way too late. And it was borrowed in very short terms as well. So bankers could call this in every six months and suddenly there'd be no credit. And mm. as it turned out, that became particularly important for Korea. And that came later on in the crisis, but the Korea looked invulnerable because mm. we didn't know how many dollars it had borrowed. In fact, even when the IMF began to look at Korea, they couldn't work out how many dollars the Koreans had borrowed because a lot of them were borrowed through their banking system in New York. So one of the legacies of that crisis was that we not, not just we as investors had paid more attention to this, the authorities, the IMF, the BIS did get into the business of more accurately tracking this foreign currency borrowing because it was slightly opaque. It wasn't really that obvious to many people. I think if you dug a bit like the Great Short, I think if you dug hard enough, you'd have found it. But people weren't being too, uh, weren't digging too much on this data, and they didn't find it. What you're describing is the carry trade. So, I actually now I've opened two fronts. I do want to talk about the carry trade, both the dollar and yen carry trade. But before we do, it was only a few years before this, or a year, depending on when we when we we draw the timeline, that the crisis in Mexico occurred, the tequila crisis, and the subsequent support or bailout, however you want to call it, of the Mexican government by the United States. What role did that crisis play in the mindset and in the calculations and assumptions of investors heading into the Asian financial crisis? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's very, very, very important. That crisis is often called the first crisis of the 21st century. And the reason that it was different is that the foreign investors who were exposed and who were withdrawing were portfolio investors and not bankers. So if you go back into the 70s, banks lost a fortune in what was called the petrodollar recycling scheme, but that was bankers. But the people who lent money to Mexico had bought these Tessa bonus, and that's what was likely to default. The Mexican government seemed unlikely to be able to make repayment on those. And the actions by the Fed, and of course by the administration itself, by the Clinton administration, effectively bailed out people owning securities. Now that was new. If those people had been bailed out in the past, it was just by a collateral accident because they were mm -hmm. there to bail out the bankers. People then who were had that sort of liquid wealth thought, well, these currency pegs are not that risky, are they? Because if you take the Tessa bonus to get the high yield and it's linked to the dollar, so you basically think you, you've got a dollar instrument, even though it's in Mexican mm -hmm. peso, and some of them were actually in dollars, 
you know, we can't lose here because we can't lose on the exchange rate. We're getting a higher yield. What's not to like? And it definitely pervaded Asia that people would do that in Indonesian rupee and take 12% and say, look, not only can I hold the Indonesian rupee knowing it's manageable, I can borrow dollars and put that into Indonesian rupee or I can borrow yen and put that Indonesian rupee. And I relate in the bank, in the book, I traveled down to Indonesia and I don't mention the names of these individuals, but some of them were friends of mine and they had borrowed yen and they were sitting with rupee deposit on the basis that the rupee could never go down against the yen. And now I can't remember the number, but it probably fell 70% against the yen. So weird. It's just, again, you can't, I think one of the hardest things I imagine about trying to really extract from financial history its most profound lessons is the difficulty of putting yourself in the time and place and what it's like to be drinking the water, breathing the air that everyone else is and living in that euphoria. Because, you know, something similar, though less egregious, happened in Europe, which is that people were lending to peripheral countries at yields that were slightly above those that they were lending to the center. And but of course they were in the same currency zone. So there were even more reasons to believe that it was kind of the same thing. It's still inexcusable when we look at it in retrospect, but it's fascinating to me. How important is that? Like, How hard is it to convey the intoxicating influence of being in the middle of a mania? It is why we need contemporaneous opinion, because it's one of the few places you can actually get it. And most historians won't pick it up because it exists in a very in a form that disappears quite quickly. All the the stuff that records that tends to get junked because people think that was so useless. So it's very hard to do it. Obviously, the benefit I have in this is I actually lived through it. So that's different. Well, what set you apart? Why were you able to hold yourself apart from the crowd and view things with a more sober mindset? Is it something about your disposition? Is it because you spent so much time before the crisis studying financial history? Is it some combination? So I cover in the book that one of the advantages I have it was to arrive fairly late. That helps. You know, it's mm. uh, you know that king is no clothes moment in Hans Christian Andersen. It does help sure. to arrive a bit later because the intoxicating liquor has only been it's been, may have been swirling around for two years, and you walk into the room and see lots of intoxicated people. The first thing you say is they're intoxicated. So it does help to come late. Time horizon is a crucial thing here. And what happens is time horizons shorten in that situation. So you walk into a room and you see that, and you can actually see people who think this is an unsustainable bubble. I mean, the best example is Sir Isaac Newton, who's probably one of the smartest people who ever lived, was master of the mint, apart from all his scientific discoveries. And yeah, of course- Few people know that. They would be stunned to just to realize what a polymath Newton was. Yeah, but he, he made a huge amount of money in what we now call the South Sea bubble. And you might think, well, there you go. He was a genius. <laughs> no, no. He took all his profits, put them straight back into the market and lost them all again. So, you know, it's even even a rational genius can get caught up in this stuff. But Newton knew this was unsustainable, but he thought he could squeeze that last bit of juice out of the lemon. And we all get into that. So it's time horizon. So all I could say mm. to you is I, I took a longer time horizon. I stuck with a longer time horizon. And that's not to do with intelligence. It's probably more to do with stubbornness than anything, but you pay a price for that. So, you know, I almost lost my job because of that. There's a price to be paid by not being a member of the crowd. So it is a lot easier Mm -hmm. to be a member of the crowd and shorten your time horizons. And and long time horizons don't pay. It's much easier to sell shorter term time horizons than long term time horizons. So I would say stubbornness, arriving late. And yes, knowing a little bit of financial history, having having read about the uh, petrodollar bust of the 1970s and then seeing all these dollars being lent all around Asia, that actually, uh, it helps. Most people in finance live through a period which they think is normal. It's only when you're 56, 70 that you realize that certain bits of it were abnormal, but it seemed mm. perfectly normal to everybody I was in the room with that this was an Asian economic miracle and it could only go one way. Yeah. I mean, so true especially the bit about arriving late. I mean, that's just something that's just out of your hands. That's luck, you know? There are a lot of really brilliant people who have been there for a while and they've been scarred and they bend the knee. They can't take it anymore, whether they can take it because they don't have the capital to continue to to keep the trade or because they just, they're emotionally, psychologically exhausted. It's difficult not just to go against the crowd. It's just difficult to be negative for a prolonged period of time. You know, you want, at some point, people just want to become positive about something. Let's go back to the um, to the carry trade, because this ropes in Western central banks, particularly the Federal Reserve. And this was under the Greenspan administration, you know, arguably perhaps the most powerful Fed chairman in the post-war period. How did the carry trade develop? 
And what role did it play and how did it evolve both in the period prior to when you arrived to Hong Kong and through the evolution of the crisis? Well, the carry trade developed more, I think, initially in, from Japan than anywhere else. Uh, we all now just believe that interest rates are low and have been low forever, but the first country to get there was Japan. And you could borrow in Japan for almost nothing. Therefore, the key issue, and you could invest that money in other currencies and get much higher yields. Now, of course, if you do that, all you're really betting on is the exchange rate because you will make money unless the yen strengthens. But as long as the yen doesn't strengthen, you're going to make money in that trade. So by 1994, the yen was incredibly strong. I think it had got to 80 and then it began to weaken. Do me a favor. Let's, again, for people that, because this can be a tricky dynamic to understand how a carry trade work, why a reduction in the value of the yen can actually be positive for capital flows in Asian countries and, and why the opposite can be destabilizing the unwinding of a carry trade. Can you explain a little bit for people who aren't familiar um, sure. with how this dynamic works? Let's say I was able to go to Japan and borrow $100 million worth of yen. So it's denominated in yen and uh, the banker charges me 1% to borrow that for a year. And I go to Indonesia, for instance, and there that currency I believe is the same as the dollar. It's pegged to the dollar and their interest rates are 12 so I sell all that money and I start earning 12. I've only got to pay one of it to my banker in Japan. And I just sit there and reap in the profits. You know, I put in no effort into this. I've got no intellectual property in this. It's just financial engineering. And I sit and I reap the profits. Now, should, of course, the Indonesian rupiah devalue, then I'm going to be paying back a lot more yen than I was in the past. But if the yen devalues, I make even more money because I've, you know, the rupiah is going up relative to the yen. So I can actually make a capital gain and get this. And the, and the speculation in Asia in the early 90s was that there was so much money pouring into Asia that actually these currencies were more likely to go up against the dollar in the yen. So you'd get the carry trade, you get the extra interest, and you'd probably also get a capital appreciation what was not to like. So you're trading currency risk or exchange rate risk for higher yield. That's what you're doing. But the conclusion here was there was no exchange rate risk. That, that was the bottom line. The prevailing view was that there was no exchange rate risk. Yeah, but you could show it because you could show how the Central Bank of Indonesia was in the market every day trying to keep the currency going up. You could see as a consequence that its reserves were going up. So you could say, how on earth can something decline in value when all the pressure on it is to go up? Right. So this is a gimme. You can't lose on this because we have all this evidence that actually if this thing's going anywhere, it's going up if the Central Bank stops intervening. So the shock was that that money stopped coming. And when that money stopped coming, suddenly there was a concept that this thing could actually go down. So when did that dynamic begin to evolve in Southeast Asia with respect to the flows of money coming out of Japan after the implosion of their stock market in the late 80s? I would date it to the first quarter of 1994 because you don't really get involved in this if you think the yen's going up because it's too dangerous. You have to believe that the yen isn't going to appreciate to do this. You have to believe that the yen is going to at least stabilize or depreciate. And by the first quarter of 94, during the Mexican crisis, it got to 80 to the dollar. And uh, you know it's a long way from 80 now, but that's as strong as it ever got. And I think from that point on, there was action then to try and stop it. And I think most people then concluded that maybe it could go up a bit, but really 80 was such an excruciatingly high level for the yen that you probably weren't taking a huge risk to start borrowing yen. So I'll, I'll date it. You know, there's no absolute number date for these things, but I would say the first quarter of 94 is when it really got going. And then right. that, that took you into 95, 96. So it gives you three years of carry trade flowing into Asia. And three years is a long time. And remember, it wasn't just these people who were speculating on the carry trade. It works the other way around as well. You would have businesses in Indonesia who were borrowing yen. Right. And so also the opportunities to invest domestically in Japan were not what they were in the 1980s. And so Japanese investors were looking outside to invest. And of course, they were investing in Asia. How important of a role did Japanese borrowing of dollars play in funding in the rest of Asia? In other words, how important was the dollar at this point in time? Yeah. So it became increasingly important. And it's a very good point because we always assume that dollars are lent by Americans. It's not true. The Japanese banks had... They had good balance sheets. We're beginning to question the quality of their balance sheets by the mid-1990s, but they, we, they were considered to be big and too big to fail. So they could borrow dollars pretty cheaply in the euro markets, and they could borrow them there, and then they could lend them to Asians at a higher level and take the spread. And as you said, there was little doing in Japan at that period, so they all got into this business of lending dollars. So the Japanese banks were one of the bigger lenders of dollars. They were, they were lending some yen. There were some people who were borrowing yen, but actually it was them. And the European banks were also lending lots of dollars. So the dollar became the chief funding 
currency because it was very easy to borrow it in euro markets. It's not so easy to borrow yen as it is to borrow dollars. And that mm. became the chief flow. So it may have started with, so there's kind of two different flows. There was a carry trade which started with Japan. But what really drove this was real corporations in Asia deciding to borrow dollars. That wasn't kind of the speculative positioning. That I mean, they actually used these dollars to build real things in Asia, to, to create real businesses. It was incredibly dangerous, but they weren't doing it just to buy and hold financial assets. They were doing it to fund real businesses. And most of that was done with dollars and not with yen. So it really, when it really got going, it was really all about the dollar, much more than financial mm. speculators playing in, in the portfolio assets. It was, about, it was about the real economy, but a badly funded real economy. Right. And it was dangerous because they exposed themselves to the risk of dollar appreciation. Yeah. All the data suggested that it couldn't happen. And then one day, I would say summer 1996, a little question mark arose in somebody's head that it was more possible. And as 96 progressed into 97, it went from the possible to the probable. And that began to affect capital inflows. So this is perfect because I wanted to ask you now, I want to bring it all the way back to stitching together the timeline of the crisis. And this will also give us an opportunity to talk about how does one go about trying to forecast the trajectory of US dollar exchange rates on international exchanges. How long after the problems began to brew in Thailand did markets begin to believe that these issues could not be contained? And that, well, I guess first, before we even get there, how? We had started talking about the problems in Thailand. I guess, when did investors begin to see that there was a crisis really brewing in Thailand? And then when did they begin to no longer comfort themselves with the view that it would be contained in Thailand and that, that there would then be contagion throughout the rest of Southeast Asia and then eventually Northern Asia? Well, we have a little barometer for that in the stock markets themselves. So you can look at the indices and see when they peaked, see when they began to fall, see when they began to fall precipitously. So for Thailand, it really is only in the second half of 1996. And as time goes on, it gets worse and worse. Interest rates go higher, which is the other thing we need to look at. The stock market comes lower, but quite a big but. The rest of the Asian markets weren't reacting very much at all. They may have been on some sort of downward trajectory by 97, but nothing dramatic, nothing major at all. I think it was very easy to look at the misallocations of capital and the unstable financial system in Thailand and show it was in Malaysia and also that it was in Indonesia. But the market wasn't doing that. And one of the ways, one of the barometers for that is to see how they valued bank share prices. And I show in the book that the price to book ratios of some of the Southeast Asian markets, the price to book ratios of the banking system, which is a measure of the just the solidity of the banks, but also the profitability of the banks were at way above American levels and astronomically high. So the market came to this very, very late indeed for Southeast Asia. But so it was really into the second quarter. Remember, China or Thailand devalues on the 2nd of July. So we were really into the second quarter and most people still didn't believe that this could get beyond Thailand. And the really fascinating thing is Thailand does this on the 2nd of July. It's not until October that it gets to Northern Asia. There was actually a period in the middle where we just said, well, this is all this Southeast Asian nonsense. It's not coming to North Asia. And that was the fascinating period, that bit where the roadrunner goes over the cliff and his legs are still going around. And then suddenly three months later, we looked down and we realized that it's a North Asian problem. It's an Asian financial crisis, not a Southeast Asian. Well, that brings us back to the point I made earlier about hope. And I'm sure in that period, there was a lot of hope, a lot of false hope because of the difficulty of trying to forecast the flows of capital. What made that period so interesting in, in your view? So I, I take credit for getting some things right during this period, but also take the blame for getting some things wrong. So I wasn't that worried about North Asia either. North Asia was different. I mean, if we take a country like uh, Hong Kong or Korea or Taiwan, these countries were running large current account surpluses. They were selling more in international exchanges than they were buying. That's what a surplus is. It's a very strong position to be in. The United States hasn't run one for many decades. These were really strong. Also, they had incredibly large foreign exchange reserves with which to defend their currencies as well. And you thought, well, there's really quite a lot of differences between these two. And that was the interesting thing. It's that how that change in portfolio flows began to affect very strong countries. And that was the weak sort of underbelly that we hadn't really seen is was how quickly bankers could get out. You kind of think of bankers as making long-term loans. And it suddenly it turned out, and we didn't know this, that they were all on three-month loans. 
brings us back to the point about liquidity and the liquefaction of assets. Yeah. So even the bank loans, which we probably in our heads thought was fairly long-term capital, turned out to be very short. So Korea is the prime example. I mean, within months, Korea was running out of reserves because the banks, Western banks were refusing to roll over their credit. And within about three months, from October to December, Korea almost went bust in three months. I mean, it's absolutely remarkable. And maybe there is someone out there who forecasts that. But no doubt when people hear this, they'll point me towards the one person who worked that out. But even looking at the chaos of Southeast Asia, I think very few of us really realized just how quickly this could get to countries that with strong that look strong. I mean, I, I should say the other thing that we underestimated was the levels of gearing. I think we knew about those levels of gearing, domestic gearing, but wouldn't didn't work out how quickly they could come home to roost. Some, some very big companies in Korea went bankrupt very quickly, and that's because they had too much debt. So, Russell, I'm going to move us to the second hour of this conversation. There's so much more I want to talk about. Certainly, I want to talk about how this crisis, the resolution of this crisis, and that particularly falls on long-term capital management and what influence the bailout of LTCM had on informing investor risk equations and behavior subsequently and what role it played in the ensuing 2008 crisis. And then I would love to talk to you about where you think we find ourselves today, specifically from 2008 to today, and what your forecast is, because you've changed your view somewhat in the last year or so after having been firmly in the deflationist camp. And I want to do that by applying some of the lessons that you learned during the Asian financial crisis, as well as some of the lessons of financial history to help us think through where things go from here, where the markets go, and what that means both for our economies, but also for political and social stability. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Russell, as well as the transcripts and rundowns to this episode and every other episode we've ever done, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library or subscribe directly through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hiddenforces. There's also a link in the summary page to this episode with instructions on how to connect the overtime feed to your phone so you can listen to these extra discussions just like you listen to the regular podcast. Russell, stick around. We're going to move the second half of our conversation into the subscriber overtime. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.